Hello, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Good morning. Yeah. All right, so I'll just go with this one then. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, for being here and thank you to everyone for inviting me. I've felt so welcome since they've been here. Um, and it's been cool to learn a little bit about your community. Uh, so I know that you don't know me, so I thought I would start off by telling you a little bit about me. Do I hit any button to start the slides? Am I good? Okay. Sweet. Thank you. All right, so as Jenny said, I'm co-owner of Ecological Design. Um, I originally hail from Nebraska, Lakota Territory. I currently live in western Wisconsin, Somerset, Wisconsin, uh, land of the Dakota and Anishinaabe. Um, my business uh, partner, Paula Westmoreland, founded my company in 2000, and I came on as a landscape crew leader in 2005 and apprenticed uh, to learn design and eventually did project management and became co-owner. So I love what I do and I've just deepened it. Um, and I actually went to school for something different. So School of Hard Knocks is uh, the way that I've liked it. Um, so we're a women-owned business uh, over 20 years, and uh, which is fairly rare uh, in this country um, to have a woman-owned firm at a broad acre region ag scale. Um, so we work with urban farmers, rural farmers, homesteaders, campuses, communities, um, and a significant amount of our work is with women. Our team is trained in holistic management, regenerative agriculture, agroecology, permaculture, and yeah, we, uh, we get to do a lot of things. So I wanna share with you, let's see if we go the right way. A little bit more about me. So I stand on the shoulders of those before me. I've had a lot of mentors in my life who have gotten me where I am. Uh, so this presentation is a collaboration of many voices and today I am the voice. So I deeply thank my children who are future ancestors uh, for always coming on job sites with me and hot or warm or rain or shine. Uh, they, you know, they're, they're game. And I sincerely thank uh, all of those experiences uh, to get me here. So I, uh, I'm Ogallala Lakota and German. Um, so I'm from the Midwest. And uh, my mother was a social worker and my father was a science teacher. So I grew up you know, learning how to care for people, um, children, elders, uh, and I also really got into prairies. I was really into, uh, you know, underneath my bed, I had bags of fossils and I was always um, digging around. Um, I learned how to garden, how to camp, how to fish at a young age. Um, and so I've always been engaged with the natural world, uh, which is very important to me. And um, as I got older, I uh, started, uh, like in high school, started being aware of environmental justice issues. Uh, pollution issues, uh, issues of uh, discrimination or uh, large uh, difference between those have, who have and have not. Um, and this drove what I studied in college, uh, eventually went into uh, environmental studies, peace and justice studies, um, geology, and I studied internationally, studying food systems, environmental justice in Bangladesh and Cuba. Thank you. Bangladesh, Cuba. I farmed in Guatemala for about a year and a half. Um, and I just wanted to learn as many regenerative agro ecosystems as I could. Um, and so that's what I did. And then I wanted to come back here. And I was involved in a lot of anti-movements, anti-war, anti-GMO, anti-Monsanto. And I looked around me and I realized that a lot of people uh, in the movement with me were unhealthy. And I didn't want to be anti in my life. I wanted to live pro. And so what I found is that uh, through farming and through the people that I was working with, I actually 
was able to you know, create a livelihood for myself being pro, uh, doing the pro things that actually work against the things that I was against. So proactively supporting life sheds is what I call it. Um, and that is kind of the basis for what I'm talking about today. So I have this quote up here from ecologist Robin Wall Kimmerer uh, that I really like. When we walk our talk, we come into alignment with our vision, our choices and actions. We are being responsible. So it's empowering to be responsible and bringing us into alignment and authenticity and integrity. And taking responsibility for our gifts and talents involves self-awareness. And it's a process, not a destination. So how I understand my gifts has deepened how I work with the land and with the people. So I'm focused on listening to the land uh, and empowering land connection. And that's where I feel I receive my power from the earth and from my ancestors. I did want to do an acknowledgment uh, here since uh, we are standing on native land in Kentucky. Um, and uh, indigenous peoples have lived on this land for 12,000 plus, plus, plus years. Um, and you know, over the various thousands of years, uh, many different indigenous cultures uh, have called this place home. So uh, they have endured forced relocation and um, their presence is still here. So I don't want to talk about it in the past, even you know, in the, the most recent census, Kentucky has over 30,000 Native Americans still living here. And through assimilation and through uh, cultural integration, uh, there's been a lot lost, right? Uh, a lot passed down that, uh, that was not passed down. So I just want to give thanks to all of our ancestors who've come here before us. Uh, Shawnee, Eastern Band of Cherokee, Chickasaw, Osage, Miami, Chisoya, Quapa, Lakota, Dakota, and those we don't have names for. And I want to uh, dedicate this talk to Michael Phillips. Uh, we lost a great this year already in 2022. Um, Michael Phillips was an orchardist, uh, farmer, carpenter, teacher. He has a, had a farm, um, Heart Song Farm in Northern New Hampshire, uh, growing apples mostly and a lot of medicinal herbs. Uh, he's author of The Apple Grower, uh, The Holistic Orchard, Mycorrhizal Planet, uh, his Lost Nation Orchard was part of the Holistic Orchard Network. Um, and he was a humble, joyful, uh, quiet wisdom. He had a keen connection with the earth, and he's gone too early. So the seeds he planted will fruit his legacy and grow in peace and plenty. He was a husband and a father and a leader and a visionary. Um, and this is a quote from his last book, Mycorrhizal Planet. We are not at the end of a rope, as it's so easy to think. Humanity can yet choose to turn direction. The moment has come to leap into action with glad hearts. The seeds are germinating, the fungi are willing, and we must be too. So thank you, Michael. All right, so in the 1970s, Henry Kissinger said, control the oil and you control the nations. Control food and you control the people. US destroyed family farming uh, and abroad uh, and led to 95% of the grain reserves being under the control of six agribusinesses. Uh, Rita Corbin was a Catholic worker, artist, made this image. Uh, it's a nonviolent lay movement started by Dorothy Day and Peter Marin in the 1930s. And it says, the works of mercy feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit the sick, shelter the homeless, visit the prisoners, bury the dead, pray for the living and the dead. And the work of war destroys crops and land, seizes food supplies, destroys homes and villages, scatters families, contaminates water, imprisons dissenters, inflicts wounds and burns and kills the living. So what will we choose? How will we grow to be peacemakers for the regeneration nation?
So what, so what is Regeneration Nation? Uh, what does it mean? I consider it a call to action. Uh, one of the ways I was thinking of it is if I could give a message to every single person in the world and they would hear it, what would it be? What would you do? Um, and for me, hope, peace, joy, love is what came for me. Uh, life is purpose, purpose in itself. Life is purpose in itself. And uh, when it comes to earth, we can heal. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of things wrong with the earth right now. I don't need to list them for you. Uh, but what I understand in my work and uh, with people is that we can rapidly change the world for the better. And Mother Nature is conspiring with us to do so, and she can work faster than we understand. So with our support as active regenerators, or as we like to say, as keystone species uh, in our environment, we can make a difference. We are nature working, as permaculturalist Penny Livingston says. There's no separation uh, between us. So this is an image from Klee Benali, a Diné artist, it says what we do to the mountain, we do to ourselves, right? What we do to the water, we do to ourselves, and what we do to the soil, we do to ourselves. There is an opportunity to become the best regenerators of ourselves and earth as we can be. So as a regeneration nation vision, it's kind of simple. Uh, clean water, nutrient-dense food, shelter, sanitation, with an ethic of care of earth, community, and equity. One could say, in less words, sovereignty, that we can determine our systems and our culture. Um, how, over the last 20 years, I've been immersed in permaculture and regen ag, and I've had the honor of working with people who are implementing a lot of new food projects, making their homestead more holistic, improving their local food access to their school, transitioning their conventional farm to beyond organic, uh, building relationship with the land, working with uh, the aftermath of weather disasters, floods and droughts, uh, family hardships. I'm able to see the Regeneration Nation path pretty clear because I've experienced it. I know it's real. Uh, not just some fluffy, futuristic, uh, technological ideal. And I know that everybody's path is different. So your resilient path um, is based on your context. It's not going to look the same as your neighbor, right? Um, and it also is dependent on the context of your land that you're a custodian of. So when it comes down to it, what do we really need? Practices that support life on this earth clean water, nutrient-dense food, healthy soil, renewable energy, safety, shelter, right regenerative culture. And I see this as honoring our ancestors and our future ancestors. So uh, the regenerative ag practices help us align this. Food security means knowing uh, where your next meal comes from, but food sovereignty is a much deeper idea. It's about having the power to decide how you and your community will shape your food system. So I like to focus on food security. Um, you may have heard of J. Russell Smith before. In 1929, J. Russell Smith wrote Tree Crops, A Permanent Agriculture. It's an epic book for agroforesters and farmers around the world. Um, Smith wrote, the use of land uh, for its physical conditions. He, he insisted that farming should fit the land. And this was not a, a concept that was much talked about at that point. Um, and I would add, you know, as we build the relationship to the land, our farming shifts to align. And as we build our relationship to our community, our farming shifts to align. So Smith had a vision of what the hills and lands would be. And I love this, I'm gonna read it to you. I see a million hills green with crop yielding trees and a million neat farms snuggled in the hills. These beautiful tree farms hold the hills from Boston to Austin, from Atlanta to Des Moines. And the hills of my vision have farming that fits them and replaces the poor pasture, the gullies, and the abandoned lands that characterize today 
<clears throat> so large to part of these hills. These ideal farms have their level and gently sloping land protected by magnum terraces and are intensively cultivated, rich in fields and yields of alfalfa, corn, clover, legumes, wheat, and garden produce. This plowland is the valley bottoms, level hilltops, the gentle slopes, and flattened terraces on the hillside. So the unplowed lands are partly shaded by cropping trees, mulberries, persimmons, honey locusts, grafted black walnut, grafted heart nut, grafted hickory, grafted oak, and harvest yielding trees. There is better grass beneath these trees than covers the hills today. I love that perennial vision. Um, and same with the vision for humans on the social end of things. Um, I think one of the most important things we can do is uh, connect elders to youth and youth to elders. Um, so if you don't have a mentor, go find one. And uh, if you don't have someone that you're mentoring, offer it to someone because we all have knowledge to share. Uh, and this is uh, part of connecting what Sir uh, Albert Howard called the wheel of life. Um, Wendell Berry in 2012 was giving a Jefferson lecture and talks about this, um, this cycle. He said, the problem of sustainability is simple enough to state. It requires the fertility cycle of birth, death, decay, um, and what Albert Howard called the wheel of life. So this should turn continuously in place so that the law of return is kept and nothing is wasted. So for this to happen, the stewardship of humans, there must be a cultural cycle in harmony with the fertility cycle. <clears throat> the cultural cycle is an unending conversation between old people and young people, assuring the survival of local memory, which has, as long as it remains local, the greatest practical urgency and value. So this is what is meant by sustainability. The fertility cycle turns by the law of nature and the culture cycle turns on affection. So these two are happening together synergistically. This for me is all part of Regeneration Nation and being in service. So we're custodians. Uh, there's a young environmental activist and musician, uh, Shutakat Martinez. And he was asked, uh, what moment or experience made you want to change the world? And he said, I don't want to change the world. I think the narrative of wanting to change the world is a lot less tangible for people, and I think it actually often removes people from feeling empowered to create small change. And it takes away the power of creating change in our lives, in our families, in our communities. So I think at first I had this grand idea of changing the world, and then I realized that change comes from really small places. And it begins with how we change our lives, and our communities, and our culture, and that influences humanitarian change in the world. So as farmers, you have this incredible position to bring health to yourself and your community. And each community uh, achieving a healthy local food system and economy adds up to feeding the world without all of the toxic side effects and corporate middlemen of the global agribiz, meaning of feeding the world. So working together as farmers in this region, you have the opportunity for impacting the health of your entire ecosystem and it's a great honor and responsibility, uh, but it's also a fulfilling, joyful path. So I consider myself an earth citizen. Uh, I have a love of this country and I'm a patriot to the land. I identify as an earth custodian and I see us being a regeneration nation um, as we're remembering to be a good ancestor in the Anthropocene. Uh, when I think about my children, I think about this quote uh, from uh, Ruth Miller. She is the climate justice director of uh, Native Movement. And she's, she was asked uh, what she would tell the future peoples of the earth. And she says, I would tell them the coming generation that we're preparing ourselves for you. We're readying this place for you. You, our descendants, are worthy of fighting for and you are worthy of a safe and healthy home. I concur. 
So with permaculture, uh, you know, I just want to mention that all of the observations and understandings uh, really come from indigenous knowledge and uh, aboriginal knowledge. And it was spread through uh, those practices and philosophies from other indigenous peoples across the world. Um, these ideas don't belong to anyone. They have been developed over thousands of years. So it's very important not to appropriate this information as I go through. We use the scale of permanence at my company at Ecological Design. Uh, this basically means uh, we go from, we look at the things that are hardest to change uh, all the way over to the things that are the easiest to change. It's based on the 1950s P.O. Yeoman's key line scale of permanence. Uh, and I think that this is helpful as we move through uh, looking at land. We look at folks' holistic context with the land. So there's a lot of questions there. And as we move through the scale of permanence, it helps us uh, make decisions in order of operation so that we don't have to go back because we put the well in the wrong place, right? For example. Um, and then we also look at the social and the economic context uh, for the designs. So all of that together. Uh, I, I'm going to highlight some of the more exciting things that I think are more revolutionary uh, today of regeneration nation practices and I get to work with all these custodians and agrarians and implementing regenerative practices and we really just use mapping as the communication tool it's simply a tool for action um, and it turns those principles into practices so we're gonna look at the building blocks of life water earth animals, plants, fungi. So water, water is the foundation of planetary life. 70% of all life is water. Not a coincidence, same with our bodies. Um, and these are incredible understandings of water right now that are being remembered and learned. So I just wanna say off the bat, please test your water, know your water. Uh, I know a lot of people that have had some dangerous experiences with their water, not knowing on the land. Uh, so please test your water and know your water. And there's a lot of ways to know your water. Um, we have more things in our water than we've ever had in history before. So your water might have been okay, um, and, but you need to keep checking that it's okay. <clears throat> Every farmer knows that the plants look better after rain than after irrigation. Healthy water brings healthier crops. So a regenerative water design, uh, for me, um, gives gratitude to the water on site. And it's one that cycles water as many times as possible on the same site before leaving. So set your bar high. This is Zach Weiss. Uh, he's an amazing earth worker, owner of Elemental Ecosystems. Um, and his interesting take on water, I wanted to share, you know, just that water is always moving through the landscape, it's moving through the air, it's moving through the soil, it's constantly in motion. And this healthy water cycle um, is forests that are seeding moisture in the air, causing clouds and precipitation. And that phase change draws in more precipitation. Um, so it's a pump, it's a biotic pump and where the living ecosystems of the continents actually draw moisture from the oceans and from the evaporation inland to different continents. So that's what we call this full or this full water cycle. Um, now the water cycle is increasingly disturbed and this is, uh, we'll see this with water cycles on landscapes, on extreme landscapes. So uh, where the water used to infiltrate and run in, uh, downstream, now it's just leading to flooding and uh, it's not being absorbed. And uh, then it's followed by drought. And in worst cases, fire, because the land is being desiccated. So water is the ultimate capital of any farmer. Uh, what we're working to create in, uh, in doing earthworks is a decentralized water system. I'm trying to decentralize in general in what I do. Um, but where water is held at different points in the landscape, right? And particularly the best place, the best battery to store water is in the soil. But then we can also have these other uh, points in which we can uh, hold them, store that. Uh, but if the, the soil is fully uh, saturated and has a large amount of organic matter, then we're essentially sub-irrigating from the bottom, from the soil, not from 
irrigation. Uh, this is a really, really long-term vision. Uh, so the more that we get to it right now, the better uh, for the next century. Zach talks about if you look at any climatology textbook, uh, it'll tell you most of the heat dynamics on Earth come 75, 95% um, are determined by water vapor. But yet, we hear all this about carbon and climate change, right? Um, and sometimes that feels overwhelming, the carbon and the climate change discussion. Uh, and what he talks about is actually what we're experiencing is a, is a symptom of a severe disruption in our water cycle. And what's great is that we can really individually and as a community all work on water solutions and it's very tangible because it's clean water for ourselves, it's water for our animals, um, we have an immediate feedback response. Uh, but what's actually really great too is that when we affect the water cycle, we're affecting the, the carbon cycle. So according to NASA, water regulates about 75 to 95% of the climate and carbon only about four to 20%. So by focusing on restoring our water cycle, we're also restoring this carbon cycle, which I think is very important right now. If you wanna learn more about Zach, you can check out waterstories.com. So way back uh, in 1879, there's this guy, John Wesley Powell, and he suggested that we should organize our states by watershed. Wow. Can you imagine if that would have happened instead of all these rectangles and squares and plat maps? If we actually organized by what affected us, upstream affecting those downstream, right? Uh, he said at this point, you know, particularly looking west of the Rockies, he identified future water conflicts would be inevitable by organizing the way that we did. Uh, but he was outpowered mostly by the railroads who wanted to uh, press their rains follows the plow theory, which we now know is incredibly wrong. So I think we should organize by watershed as your farmer groups uh, look to those in your watershed because everything that affects you all, you all should be working together for. Kentucky looks really crazy on that too, by the way. So this map was developed by Courtney White. Courtney White's the founder of Co Quivira Coalition. I don't know if you can see that okay, but uh, it's a map of what carbon country would look like. So he was very focused on carbon at the time. Uh, and he now realizes this map was, was incomplete and it needed more trees and indigenous land management projects and wool mills and cattle grazing crops and whatnot. But it's still relevant because it includes the full cycle. So not just the farmers, it includes the eaters, uh, the urbanites. Um, and, and really the point of it is when we're talking about climate change, uh, we have too many separate and competing camps. And so, uh, and leaving people on the sidelines. So the point of this map is really unity solutions. Um, and so it's a great book. It's called uh, Grass Soil Hope, A Journey Through Carbon Country. Uh, Courtney White is, is incredible. And uh, while he was, while Courtney White was on uh, his travels, he had heard a story about a man uh, who had put these short fences along a cattle trail uh, in the sandy bottom of a canyon in Navajo country. And so the cattle were forced to meander in an S pattern as they walked around. And they were encouraging the water, therefore, to meander too. And the erosion started slowing down. And he thought this idea was really, really amazing. And that's because right now we have the standard solution for degraded creeks. And we spend a bunch of money on cement and riprap and uh, diesel driven machines and uh, putting fences in the way cattle uh, like to walk lets cattle do the work for us. How cool, right? So this is a very important component of regenerative agriculture, letting animals do the work or letting the water do the work for us. So there's Bill, uh, he's, um, he helps us understand the, the, the movement of water. He is a great observer. Um, and so like, how does water regenerate itself? Uh, support that, mimic that. Water swirls. Water doesn't ever go straight. When you make water go straight, you take away its ability to clean itself, which means it takes away its ability to give us vitality, right? So we don't want straight ditches. 
uh, we want to allow the water to um, meander, as Bill says it. Uh, Bill's a retired biologist for the U.S. Food uh, Forest Service, and then he just kind of turned into a riparian restoration specialist. It became his passion. And uh, he has a whole toolbox of um, things that we can do with being very light on the earth, low-tech earthworks. So one rock dams, weirs, uh, putting uh, willows in, putting baffles into um, the creek, putting rocks into the creek, slowing it down, still letting it go, letting it remember how to meander. Because uh, as it slows, it starts to go into its own form, which then starts cleaning itself. These are really important. There's an example of a re-meandered creek in Minnesota. This is from my colleague's book, This Perennial Land. Uh, but essentially, yeah, we're just stopping, we're slowing down that water. And as soon as you slow down that water, guess what comes? Sedges, grasses, willows, all the things that allow the water to even better meander without all that concrete. Soil. So a nation that regenerates its soil regenerates itself, right? We can build soil faster than ever before. It's not that one inch for 100 years, or whatever we were taught. Um, so you're farmers and you know that soil is probably the most regenerative thing. Soil gives me a lot of hope with climate change. Some dung beetles in there, looking at a lot of organic matter. So when we look at soil, I'm thinking a lot about nutrient density. When we look at what's in the soil in the top crust of the earth, those same components are the same components that are in our human body. The exact same ones, right? And we're an ecosystem. We're a combination of these fungal and bacterial microorganisms, and we have the ability to perfectly digest all the microbes that are present. Um, so only 10% of our cells are human. And that means the rest of our entire ecosystem is microbes. We have four billion cells replaced every day. So you literally are what you eat, right? Uh, every two weeks we get new blood. Every seven years we get new bones. We want to be building that with good fuel, right? Um, so why is that related? We're just, you know, it's related because we're trying to avoid degenerative diseases. Um, which right now we are, we are at a max right now in our country for. And so the nutrition comes from the soil, we know this. And if we aren't receiving the minerals that we need to replicate our DNA and support the enzymes uh, for the health of our cell function, we can't regenerate successfully. And if we want to avoid disease and pests in our fields, uh, we really need to look at this nutrition of the soil. And that's how I understand the premise of healthy soils. So as we begin to build our uh, soil health, uh, I just want to remind us of the soil principles uh, from Jay Fuhrer in North Dakota, um, and then later Gabe Brown. Um, so eliminating or minimizing tillage, covering that soil, uh, keeping a living root in our soil, increasing diversity, always an answer, um, and then integrating livestock, whether those are alive or uh, with your manure. And I would add eliminate chemicals. Um, and so another way to think about it is conservation agriculture plus holistic grazing. Uh, add in your biodiversity and your organic agriculture and you have regenerative agriculture. Um, Gabe Brown's story is, is, is a great one if you don't know it, but essentially in the early 90s, uh, he inherited his uh, in-laws farm in Bismarck and uh, had been conventional tillage practices and after a series of uh, freak intensive storms, I uh, was going to lose the farm and decided to take a leap into regenerative agriculture practices. Um, and so he really turned the farm around and decreased his input use, decreased uh, his, all the money that was going into those things and got off of synthetic fertilizers. Um, and really started uh, integrating his, his cattle. And 20 years later, you know, he has a 5,000 acre ranch um, and he's increased his crop yields 20, 25% more. Um, 
He went from a 1.9% organic matter to 6%. And in 91, he was seeing like a half inch of water infiltrating uh, during rainstorms. And now he can infiltrate eight inches of water per hour in his fields, decreasing or eliminating flooding in his neighbor's farm fields. Uh, so we're seeing an incredible change there, right? His soils have 96 tons of carbon per acre in the top 48 inches, 10 to 30 tons of Stored carbon is what's typical on a conventional farm. So these practices are real. We can do them very quickly. There's a lot of other regenerators that we can do this uh, that I could give you examples from, but uh, one of the main things I would say highlights of his in, in addition to grazing cover crops is just high diversity cover crops. So encouraging you, I always say, no less than three, three is the magic number, uh, but he would, he's going 10, 20 species in his cover crops. And it makes a huge difference uh, when we get to that. So I would encourage you to look at your cool season grasses and your cool season broadleafs and your legumes and your warm season grasses and your warm season broadleafs and diversify that. Animals, nature is perfectly made. So we have the carnivores and we have the herbivores and the omnivores and the pollinators and the decomposers, et cetera. And this beautiful symphony of life is all connected. So the more strands that are strengthened, uh, the more ecosystems come into their full expression. So animals do this. So we want to ask ourselves with animals, how do they regenerate themselves? How are we being regenivores? How are we being good regenitarians? My uh, colleague and friend Peter uh, Allen at Mastodon Valley Farm, he says, are we eating our ecosystem? Because our ecosystem regenerates when we eat it, right? not when we conserve it and let it alone to be stagnant, right? Uh, a regeneration nation brings the animals back to the land. We need to take them back out of the barns and put them back on the land. Uh, so that's regenerative ag, uh, agroecology, uh, multi-species grazing, a flirt, silvopasture, um, biomimicry, this is how we must live. So uh, cows have six stomachs, you know, that's because they're perfectly made to turn sunshine and grass into meat and milk, right? Perfectly made. Um, goats and sheep, you know, the browse those woods and pastures for us. Honoring the pigness of the pig, as Joel Salatin says, you know, allowing uh, the pigs to till and compost. Um, having those poultry scratch and eat the bugs for us. So letting them do the work and seeing how that can fit into our system. And we have this amazing opportunity that our forefathers didn't have. We have electric fencing. We can be the predator for cheap. We have solar power, right? We are in the most opportunistic time right now to regenerate in that way. This is our friend uh, Sue Wicca's farm, Paradox Farm in Minnesota. And these goats don't leave the pasture, meat and dairy goats. Uh, it's called Milk Star Galactica, and it's a mobile milking parlor. And the back of it has the, the milking parlor, and they have a little shelter, and it's pulled by an electric vehicle. Everything is very quiet and clean. It's beautiful. So we can make tractors, we can move animals, we can have pigs come and clean up our vegetable fields uh, and fertilize it at the same time. We can flash graze animals through areas that we need to clean up instead of using our, uh, our diesel. Another part of the animals I just wanted to highlight was the bees just because we've got a lot going on with the bees right now. Um, and pollinator habitat is so vital so we know, you know three-fourths of the world's flowering plants, 35% of the world's crops, they directly are related to this pollination. 80% of crops are indirectly related to pollination. Um, and what I see mostly is when people are planting out their pollinators, they're not thinking of the full season and they're not thinking of the full uh, habitat. So I encourage you to Look at that, you can make your own pollinator plan or you can see if NRCS has a pollinator TSP near you. The CP42, the high diversity pollinator mixes are really fairly expensive. 
Um, so you don't have to have a super expensive one or go for the super expensive one if you get cost shared, right? Um, so look at all of that. Look at your ground nesting birds in the spring and make sure you know, uh, think about all of the bats, birds, butterflies, bees, beetles, right? Graze your pollinator, stack your functions. Another really cool thing about the bees right now that we're figuring out is when you feed uh, myco mycelium syrups, myco syrups to bees in hives, when you put fungal mats around hives, uh, we're seeing their viruses and diseases go away and their mites. So we're seeing an incredible amount of work coming out from Paul Stamets right now in regenerating the bees uh, by integrating these fungi syrups. And I think this is really critical information. The author of Edible Forest Gardens, Dave Jackie, he likes to say the seven Fs of permaculture, uh, which I think are fun. Food, fiber, fiber fodder, uh, fertilizer, pharmaceutical, uh, and fun. Um, and so I think we, I would like to look at all of those when we're looking at our farm, our whole farm ecology, right? Like how can we uh, bring those ecosystems back to health while providing uh, for our material and our cash needs? So how do we learn from the plants? We know that a lot of our nutrient deficiencies are leading to our chronic diseases, inflammation, depression, um, across the board. And as we increase our health, uh, we, will, we will see a decrease. These are slides from Catherine DeCara, uh, looking at the Real Food Campaign from Bionutrient uh, Food Association. Those reports are really worth looking at. You know, our grandmother's carrot uh, is nothing like the carrot that we have now. We have lost an incredible amount of nutrition in our seed stock. <clears throat> when we look back to heirloom seeds, we see how much more nutrients there are in them, right? So we need to be looking at our seed banks and our seeds, uh, where they come from and how we're preserving them and sharing them and uh, acclimatizing them to our climate, right? Um, Back in 2009, there was a proposal called the 50-Year Farm Bill. Some of you may have heard of it. And this really caught my eye. Uh, basically, you know, it's looking at our boom and bust agriculture right now that we have with the farm, five-year farm bill and, and perennializing 70% uh, of the land, which includes perennializing greens. So the Land Institute and University of Minnesota, Forever Green, um, have been working together to perennialize wheat. And so that means that we get a, uh, like a native prairie grass root with a grain head on the top, right? We can combine it, we can graze it, we can use it as a riparian buffer. This is radical. It's called Kernza, an intermediate wheat. So I think that is incredibly important. Those are some other perennial crops that are being created right now too, that are being, uh, they're not genetically modified, they're being bred, right? So check out uh, Forever Green uh, initiative. Silvopasture and alley cropping. These are uh, two of the best ways that I'm seeing us build soils, get more diversity in our income and stack functions in the same place on our farms. Uh, so uh, when we're here in Kentucky, you know, uh, things that we may not have formally thought about, but persimmon, pawpaw, jujube, uh, mulberry, Chinese chestnut, northern pecans, heartnut, hickory. Uh, when we're looking at the timber, thinking about black walnuts and uh, black locusts for fence posts, tulip poplar, basswood for pollinators, uh, oaks, obviously, and maples, and pines, pine mulch. Thinking about shrubs like aronia and elderberry and blueberry and early brambles, increasing those. The, those are going to weather uh, our extreme climate change uh, patterns more. Making tree hay, pollarding, uh, remembering some of our ancient practices with trees. And right now, uh, it's great because USDA, the whole alphabet soup, USDA, NRCS, SWCD, SARE, uh, your local hunting organization, your local conservation uh, nonprofit, your watershed district, they're funding these regenerative practices. So don't. So, so don't get overlooked. Uh, team up with your neighbor and try to, and try to um, 
get funding, work with someone else if, if you feel like they're a better writer. You know, don't feel overwhelmed by applying for funding. I really want to encourage you. And if the first person that you work with isn't a great person to work with, go to the next person because that happens, right? Um, so, you know, agroforestry, high tunnels, fencing, uh, cover crops, pollinator habitat, uh, field buffers, grass waterways, riparian buffers, conservation plans for organic transition, integrated pest management, uh, grazing management, all of this can be cost shared right now by the government. So let's get money to the doers. Fiber shed, you thought about being a fiber farmer? Uh, fiber sheds are described as place-based textile systems, focus on the source of raw materials, and it has this transparency of the supply chain. So a lot of the things that we uh, maybe have lost in our cultural history are being mapped out. So finding those weavers and the dyers and the knitters and the uh, designers and the seamstresses and this local economy, because we don't really make clothing in America anymore. And all these benefits about being fiber farmers, right? So we've got Angora goats and rabbits and alpacas and yak, not just uh, sheep, right? We have a lot of ways that we could do it. Hemp, flax, wool, cotton, milkweed, nettle, the way it used to be done. Uh, all that processing is starting to come back now. Uh, it's an incredible uh, way to heal your watershed and, and sequester carbon. Alan Savory says, if we want to offer hope to the future generations, we'll have to root not only the food we eat, but the clothing we wear in new regenerative agriculture that manages livestock using holistic grazing practices. Hemp, part of the fiber, uh, part of the fiber shed. There's 20,000 uses for hemp. CBD is at the bottom. It's just one. I'm mostly interested in fiber for hemp. We know the history of hemp, and uh, we have a short-term amnesia uh, memory here in the United States. And it was not very long ago that we had a really robust hemp industry, and it's the most ancient plant that has evolved with humans, right? So it's time that we start utilizing it and figuring out how to bring back the processing, because all the equipment and everything went away in the last 100 years. Um, and the people that didn't want it and that made it illegal, you know, are the people that were directly being threatened by its market. Um, Rockefellers for the oil, DuPont because of nylon, right? Uh, Hearst because he owned all the forests and did the newspapers. So all those people didn't want that, the hemp oil, the hemp car, everything that we had way back in the 1930s. It's time to get back to that. There's some hemp we were running chickens through. We did hemp, we don't need to mimic, uh, just because hemp is coming back, we don't need to mimic the monoculture uh, tillage practices uh, that we're seeing it happen and roll out right now on large scale. Uh, we did this with rolling out with a bed um, with paper mulch, um, and we used holistic sprays, and we used integrated ground covers, so we had diversity and not monoculture. So you don't have to uh, imitate the large scale monocropping systems. I just want to say I think fungi is probably the most uh, most important and under, misunderstood thing uh, in regenerating our soils and our health. So it really stacks functions. This is the Stametsian model of permaculture with a twist, but looking at your entire farm system and seeing how many different ways you could integrate mycelium and mushrooms. And really inoculating the plants. Whenever we do uh, planting or installations, I always do root dips. We're seeing uh, that whenever you're transplanting or integrating, uh, inoculating your plants, your soil, your seeds with microbes uh, helps them talk to each other faster, uh, but also is weathering this drought better in extreme, extreme conditions. So really look at inoculating your soil food web. Remineralize yourself, remineralize your land. If you have dogs, have them bury the bones all around the farm. Microremediation. Right now, we're seeing with microremediation uh, an incredible shift because we have so much pollution that we need to deal with. And for very cheaply, very low cost, we're able to grow mycelium and it breaks down any PCBs, petroleum, cigarette butts. I use uh, boons. 
uh, like this. You can stack bags with, micro uh, with sawdust and um, wood chips uh, with your mycelium. Stake that at the edges of where you feel uh, you might be getting polluted by your neighbor's water or whatever kind of pollution might be coming in. Maybe you have a lot of geese uh, hanging out on one area and you have too much E. coli on your land. Uh, use oyster mushroom mycelium for that, right? It takes it out. You can do the same with heavy metals. I just wanna remind ourselves about the regenerative economy uh, and there's so much more than just the money coming in and going out, right? So uh, I think this is part of the regeneration nation and I'm really into mapping so people can feel empowered, right? So I look at the watershed, this is a watershed by me, and I start looking at who are all the players and what's going on. And I would encourage all of us to do this. These are free open source uh, tools, Google Maps. Um, and we're, this one, we're looking at the opportunity maps of where things are overlapping. So where we're seeing pollution, polluted wells, and then where uh, farmers are. And so we know like the quality of our water, but also uh, if a CAFO is polluting you or if a frac sand mine is polluting you, um, how you can work with your neighbors in your watershed who are all affected by the same thing. And so as we put these layers over, we start to see the opportunity areas, so the areas that we can affect having projects together. We call that mycelia mapping, community mapping. You can check out mycelia.earth, the project that I've been working on. I work with beginning farmer ranchers, and I think it's really important. We have this 400 million acres turning over right now, the size of the Louisiana Purchase, uh, and it's kind of a big deal, right? It's the biggest land change that we've ever had in the United States. And who is going to farm that land, right? And the young people who might not have money to invest to get the land can't get in, and the elders who are trying to get out can't get out, right? So we have a very important thing happening right now that we need to be aware of. Uh, this is a Greenhorns uh, publication affording our land, which is great. And I work with uh, the Minnesota Southeast Commons right now, but uh, we're innovating uh, in agrarian trust. Uh, there's a lot of ways that we can share land and access land. And in fact, the majority of the farmers that I work with are uh, the new farmers are coming without being raised as farmers. And we're seeing the, the large increase of the new farmers coming from the city, uh, the new farmers, farmers of color, um, and women. And so uh, many of these people, they want to farm as family, they want to farm as group, they don't want to farm by themselves, and they don't want to be on the land out in the boonies by themselves either. And so this agrarian commons is a great way, we're doing 99 year leases for people to get in, um, and, and seeing uh, a huge interest and shift. So if you are one of those people, look into agrarian trust, look into agrarian commons and see if you can get a chapter started in your state. So small acts, big change. That's the point of being a regenitarian. Start will always be my message. Like make mistakes and learn. So uh, I hope that I've reawakened something that is deep inside of you and that uh, you really are called to heal the gap of ancestral knowledge. And I hope I've inoculated you today and empowered you to strengthen your mycelia. And I implore you to be a good earth citizen and peacemaker and patriot to the land and earth custodian. And I see us being a regeneration nation um, as, we, as we activate together. So thank you. How are we feeling about lunch and you have time for questions hmm? um, and i think we don't have an, an audience mic right jonathan so if you could just repeat the questions once people ask them so we can send them sure yeah. sure any questions yes sir yeah i've got uh, <clears throat> i like what you said about the the e coli and the, the mycorrhiza i have a very large creek that comes onto my farm after running through three miles of other farms that are all cattle, and I can't use the water out of it. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had the University of Kentucky come out and test it, and over a whole summer they came out about every 
five weeks of testing, and E. coli counts so high I can't use it on my vegetables. But it's a large stream. It's normally about as wide as for me to you. How would Can. I use that? How, how could I incorporate that fungi or mycorrhiza thing you were showing me? How could we incorporate that into that? Mm -hmm. and, when it, and when it rains, it'll, it'll get 100 yards wide. Okay. So you have a creek coming from a number of cattle farms. Uh, through your land and every time you test that water the E. coli is so hard that you can't use it so high that you can't use it on for your livestock well, I can't use it for, my vegetables. for your vegetables yeah. yeah so what we're seeing is a is a really quick uh, eating of the bacteria with with using mycelia the key is that mycelium needs a carbon to eat so you will need to make a series of carbon mats that could be inoculated so this could be with straw, with, um, with wood chips, using jute or hemp bags. Uh, you can make booms out of just uh, fabric even and fill it with that carbon. And then you buy the sawdust substrate, the sawdust mycelium, and that goes in with the wood. So you gotta have that carbon for it to eat. If it gets too waterlogged, uh, it might not work. If it gets super, super dry, it might not work. But what does work is having a series of, of um, well, I guess we could call it baffles, but a series that the water has to hit multiple times before it comes. Another thing is, is the water, is the creek running real straight and fast? And is there opportunity to uh, help it start circulating better before it gets in those three miles, before it gets to your farm? Um, the grasses, the deep grasses and the uh, high, you know, the uh, switchgrass and hybrid poplars and the willows, uh, those also help um, in, in bringing about that change in concert with the mycelium. Um, mm -hmm. What else? Talking with those neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, is can be difficult, um, but also being able to know like certain times of the year that it's particularly bad, and then if you can make it better at other times of the year. So I don't know how amenable they are to working with you um, and thinking about how often and being aware of all of each other's cows being in the water at the same time. Uh, that feels like a reasonable thing to discuss, but I don't know them. Um, so that won't, that won't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not just that, but the time I need to take the water out of the creek to use it or where the cows are laying in it to keep cool in the summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I do talk a little bit more in the short course, but um, another thing is if you had a water harvesting place, um, then you could filter it on site for yourself before, so once it's come out of the creek, you could have it run through your own Michael filter as well. Okay. Um, if it's getting colder, you know, blue oyster is better. Otherwise, any kind of oyster is, is really good for this kind of remediation. Um, and yeah, just make sure that you have that kind of carbon. It could be hay or straw or, you know, any sort of carbon that you have, but uh, otherwise, it it won't have anything to work with. So those are kind of the keys. Any other questions? We have beavers that block up our uh, creek. Do they, are they pretty much doing what you're saying to do? Yes. I mean, aren't they the custodians of the water? Beavers, the question's about beavers, and beavers are the engineers of nature, right? So uh, they do all of that for us in the meandering, and they get uh, they create problems for us because they plug up things, right? Um, but really what they're doing is decentralizing the water system. And so it really is a long-term drought proofing that they're doing for us. And uh, all you have to do is get some um, uh, fence posts and some welded wire if you have a culvert or something that they keep blocking up for you. Um, and, they, and that will keep them out of the culvert, which is usually most of our farmers' issues with beavers. 
Um, you can, if they're eating too many of your good oaks or your legacy trees, uh, you can just do a little uh, sand with a latex paint at the base of the tree and they're not going to want to gnaw on that tree anymore. Um, so we can work with beavers in a gentle way. We don't have to blow up their dams like the DNR does. So uh, on Gemini's farm, we don't own the riparian area by the stream and our neighbors have started deforesting this year. Um, how do you think we should bring that up to them? That you know, maybe having the riparian area will you know, reduce erosion and they have a tobacco field right up next to it. So um, I think they're probably gonna expand their field right up to the uh, David's Fort. Hmm. Well, you know, they're, they're washing away their capital, right? Um, and so any way that you can help them figure, see that if they were to install a riparian buffer, that they would be able to keep more of their nutrients on their land, mm -hmm. that doesn't feel too radical, yeah. I don't think. Because they're taking out 40-year-old you know, trees, um, and they already have a large field. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'm just trying to think, you know, how can I, you know, meet them and, and let them know you know, that there are benefits of keeping these old growth areas. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the miseducation in the United States, you know, from since the 70s has been taught farm fence row to fence row, right? And, and incentivized. Um, and so we have this kind of undoing that we need to have, you know, we have this remembering um, and thinking about trees I, th I like to think about, there's a book called Roots Demystified, if you don't know roots very well, um, but if a tap root, you're going straight down, um, and those really good erosion roots, they go out laterally and horizontally, and a lot of people get worried that those horizontal roots of the trees are going to uh, take the moisture from their cash crop field, right? Um, and so you could say like that you would do a, um, a root pruning mm -hmm. along that edge, uh, which would be okay for the tree, as long as you don't get too close, uh, just with a subsoiler. Okay, like, that's not going to be, you know, if that was the reason, for instance, that's what some folks have told me before, why they're taking out those trees, because it's robbing their moisture. So we'll, we'll, we'll do a root prune right um, every other year or something like that. Uh, you could promote them planting some smaller trees. Um, you could say, you know, I don't know what kind of crops or tobacco you said. Tobacco and corn, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, was, I was going to say something about like nitrogen fixing trees, yeah. leguminous trees. Are there, what kind of leguminous trees are there? Um, my go to would probably be honey locust. Oh, okay, really? Uh, but a lot of people like black locust. Mm -hmm. um, for me, I don't like the spikes as much, and I've seen yeah. them pop tractor tires and stuff. Yeah. Um, but honey locusts, mm -hmm. great. And, and it's also wildlife fodder too, right? Mm -hmm. But it is fixing nitrogen. You do have to interact with it a little bit um, to get that to happen. Siberian pea shrub, same. Those are probably some of my favorite nitrogen trees. Thanks. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh yeah, the intermediate wheat grass, Kernza, K-E-R-N-Z-A. Uh, General Mills is using Kernza now uh, for, we, we've, we've, I've been able to intensely be involved with Kernza in Minnesota. Uh, Patagonia is brewing a Kernza beer. We're seeing uh, the cereals, the breads, the crackers of this. This is real. This isn't some futuristic thing. This is happening. Um, and uh, the, 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 combine has, the combine has to be smaller, like for amaranth. So there is some, some equipment things that are being worked out with the processing because the seed head is still not quite as big as the regular wheat, um, as the GMO wheat that dominates our country. And Kernza is developed in collaboration with the Land Institute and the University of Minnesota uh, Forever Green. So both of those have really good information on it. And there's specific uh, distributors uh, that you can get the seed from. 
used to be you had to start with a 10 acre minimum. These things are starting to change now. Uh, and then you can also just use it as you know, a wildlife um, riparian buffer too. So it's, it's pretty wild and pretty important. Yes? I think we're close to lunchtime. Yes, okay. Ask me later, <laughs> find me. So let's give Lindsay a great big hand. Thank you, thank you.